way. So I want to encourage you tonight as he makes his way up. I want to encourage you tonight. I didn't come. I love him. There's something special, and I don't understand it, and I'm excited about pursuing whatever it is that God's done between you and I. But I didn't come to hear you tonight. I came to hear God. That's right. He's all hope with you. You don't have any. You can't help me. But God can. I love you, but you can't help me. You're exactly right. But God can. So just open your hearts and just receive what God's got for you tonight. Come on. I'd like to mention two things that I'm very thankful for, and then give you one request before we get started here. First of all, I'm thankful to be back with my friends, the Red Mile Band. These guys do a great job for the Lord, and they recognize that it's not about them. It's about serving Jesus, and I can work with people like that. Secondly, I'm thankful for the obedience of Pastor Tony. Now, for me, to tell a pastor that the Holy Ghost has put a burden on my heart for his people doesn't always result in a meeting. Some men won't listen. He listened. <coughs> he let God have his way. Those that didn't listen, they'll stand accountable for it. But those who do listen will be blessed. And then I want to make this request of you. I want you to forget that I'm up here. Because it's not about me. It's about the message. <coughs> and I want you to hear the message that God has for you. Do you really want God to speak to you? Yes. yes. Seriously. You want to hear from God. Then let's pray. Before we even open this book. And if you're serious about it. You don't have to use the exact words. But why don't you pray something like this. <coughs> Lord Jesus. Take everything from my mind that would distract me. Just, just get it out of my mind for the next half an hour. Everything I'm going to do later tonight, what I'm going to do tomorrow, next week, what happened in the past, just get it all out. God, open my mind and my heart to receive what you're going to say to me. Not what this man is going to say to me. But what you're going to say through him. Would you pray something like that from your heart? As I pray audibly this evening. My father, I've come to you many, many times in the past. You have heard and answered my prayers. And I thank thee for that. But Lord, this is a new time, a new service, and I need another touch. I cannot preach without the anointing of the Holy One. So Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come to me and speak through me for these next few moments. I'm asking you that the words that proceed from these feeble lips of clay will not be the carnal words of a man, but that these words will be spirit and they will be life. And that you will minister through us this evening, Lord. I'm asking you, O oh, Holy One, to eliminate every distraction from our minds and our hearts and to manifest your presence in a magnificent way. Speak through me tonight and speak to the hearts of every soul in this house. I don't doubt for a moment, Lord Jesus, that there are those here that have great needs. And I cannot meet them. 
But God, thou art able. Do for us what we're not able to do for our own selves. In the mighty name of our merciful Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you have a copy of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I will share with you what God has laid upon me. Now, this is Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. And the way he introduces himself to them is the way I want to present myself to you this evening. And there's a message in this, and I pray that you'll receive it. In verse number one of the second chapter, and when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message, my preaching, it was not in plausible or enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the Spirit and the power so that your faith does not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, the Apostle Paul lived in a much different generation that we live in this evening. He lived in a generation that had not yet been introduced to technology. And so if you wanted a word or a message or information, you would have to get it by word of mouth or by the written page. Later in time, the newspaper was invented. The telegraph was invented. And technology progressed and progressed unto where we are this evening in what can rightly be called the technological age. You are living in a generation when you can get anything you want anytime you want. You can get news anytime you want. In so much that newspaper companies are considering going out of business for such few subscribers. People are using social media. People are using the internet, the radio, the television. And I'm by no means saying that any of these things are wrong by nature. But I am saying that technology has affected our churches as well. This is a generation where people get the idea, I'm going to do church but I'm going to do it on the internet. And I'm not talking about people that are not able to get out. Don't misunderstand me. If you can't get out and get to church and all you can have is radio and television and internet, then I'm glad for those avenues. But there will never be a replacement for God's people coming together as one corporate body in Christ, in one accord, in one spirit, in one heart, for one purpose, and that is all about Jesus Christ. And I pray that that's why you're here this very evening. You want to hear Jesus speaking to you. As I said, Paul was living in a different generation. But here's the struggle he faced. The city of Corinth was obsessed with philosophy and wisdom. And Paul could have sat down with any of them, Pastor, and went toe-to-toe -to -toe in wisdom and knowledge. But he said, when I came to you, my approach 
was not man's wisdom. It was not deep philosophical thought. It was not the ways of the world. My approach and my message was one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I would to God that every preacher could get back to that. Let me say a word to the preachers. If you're preaching current events, stop. If you're preaching the ways of the world, stop. Stop. If you're preaching your own opinion or the traditions of your fathers, stop. Preach one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the only message that is going to matter when it's all over with. So though Paul may have been pressured to try some new approach, he remained steadfast. He knew what it was that God had called him to do. And he was confident that the gospel had the power to get the job done. You're looking at a man this evening that still believes that there's power in the simple gospel. Christ died. He was buried. And he rose again. I believe there's still enough power in that one message to change the life of anybody who will hear it and believe it. And so our approaches may change. And now we have different avenues. And thank God we can use television and the internet and the radio. And thank God we have sound systems. And thank God we can put words on a screen. But let's not allow technology to pull us away from the one central message. And that message is Jesus Methods change, and that's okay. But the message can never be changed. Amen. If we change our message and we depart from Christ uh, and the preaching of his cross, uh, then we need to just go ahead and get out of the ministry and go do something else. Uh, it's all about Jesus. Uh, I've come to you uh, not with enticing words uh, of man's wisdom, uh, but I've come to you to tell you that for whatever is wrong in your life uh, right now, Christ uh, is right uh, in your life right now. And whatever problem you've got right now, Jesus is the answer. Notice with me that this was the central message that the Apostle Paul preached to, to the multitudes that he encountered. He said, when I came to you, I declared unto you the testimony of God. He was committed to sharing the gospel with as many as he possibly could. Now let me say this. When you commit yourself, whether you be a pastor, an evangelist, or just a born-again Christian, when you commit yourself to sharing the gospel, do not assume that you will be able to do it without obstacles. Now somebody help me preach tonight. Don't let me stand up here alone. Now, don't come unplugged on me before we even get started good. Now, I'm telling you, when you commit yourself uh, to sharing Jesus uh, with everybody you can, you can expect uh, to meet obstacles head on. Right. Why? The devil hates that message. And he's going to do everything that he can to suppress it uh, and to keep it down. He didn't want you talking about Jesus. He didn't want you magnifying the grace of God. Uh, he didn't want you witnessing to anybody. He wants you to be silent. Uh, but oh, my friend, uh, we need some believers, Brother Steve, uh, who say I'm determined uh, to preach Jesus uh, and him crucified no matter what uh, comes against me you can't expect others to hear about Jesus if you're not willing to share him can I give you one illustration 
How many of you would come into agreement with me that cancer is a terrible, horrible affliction? All right? Imagine that God supernaturally gave to me the cure for cancer. Question. Would you consider me an evil man if I had the cure for cancer and told no one? Are you with me? Would I be a mean, cruel, heartless individual if I knew what would cure people of the dreaded disease of cancer and I kept it to myself? Rightfully so. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a disease that is far worse than cancer. Cancer may destroy the body, but there is something called S-I-N. And it not only destroys the body, but it destroys the soul. It's a terrible, terrible affliction. It's the worst in all the world. And here we sit uh, uh, this very evening, uh, uh, Pastor Tony, uh, and God uh, has given to us uh, the cure uh, for the disease of sin. Uh, it is the glorious gospel uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so what kind of people uh, are we uh, if we don't take it and share it uh, with everybody we meet? I know what that problem is. I know what your problem is because I have the same one. I'm not some high-class preacher preaching to low-class people who do anybody that acts that way. We're the same. And my problem is the same as your problem. We're sitting around waiting on the perfect situation to tell somebody. Hello? Well, this just might not be the right time, and I've got to wait till things get better in their life, and, and I've got to wait till they do this or do that, and then I'll tell them, hey, every day that they live uh, apart from the grace of God ain't going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. Uh, every day lived in sin uh, gets a little worse and worse. Uh, there's never going to be uh, a perfect situation. Uh, so right now, in the present tense, it's time that we say, I've been silent for far too long. I'm committing myself. When I leave this building tonight, I will open my mouth and I will speak the name of Jesus to somebody in need. God didn't wait for me to clean my life up before he gave me the gospel. I hope none of you think that way. And listen, there's churches all over the world that preach that kind of garbage and they spew out the nonsense of, well, if people will just cover up their tattoos and get their hair cut a certain way and dress a certain way and stuff the right translation under their arm, then we'll accept them. The only problem with that is it's not true. God accepts you in Christ just as you are. He doesn't say reform your life, get better, change your clothes, and then I'll love you. But no, while you were still in sin, a drinking and a cussing and a blaspheming God, Christ died for you. God loved you before you ever thought of his holy name. God is not waiting on you to get better. 
He's waiting on you to throw up your hands and say, I can't do it. And that's when God steps in. When you say, I can't handle this. I ain't getting any better. I can't reform my life. Lord, I give it to you. I'm bringing all the broken pieces before Jesus. Hey, can I, tell you, can I say this, Brother John? God doesn't mind if your life is broken in pieces. As long as you're willing uh, to bring all those pieces uh, and lay them down uh, at the feet of Jesus uh, and say, Lord, uh, I made a mess. Uh, I've done ruined it. Uh, I need the gospel to fix what's wrong in my life. Amen. That's when God will help you, friend. When you come to the end of your rope and say, I can't help myself. I need the gospel. And that's what Paul went with. Not himself. Not a personal agenda. It wasn't about him. It was all about Jesus. Now, it's sometimes hard for highly educated people to speak on a level where the common man can get it. Paul was highly educated. But he spoke the gospel in such simple terms that no one left scratching their head thinking, what did he say? When I was in college, they begged me to go hear this guy who they said was the greatest preacher of their generation. They said, man, he's deep. Well, I went and heard him. He wasn't deep. He was muddy. <laughs> You get so deep, it's so muddy, you can't see nothing. For 30 minutes, I listened to that man brag about all the churches he had built, all the people he had baptized. He had done this and he had done that. And for 30 minutes, I never once heard the word Jesus. Now, in your book, that might be preaching. But in my book, if you ain't talking about Jesus, you ain't preaching. Yes, I will say that again, Lord. In my book, if you're not talking about Jesus, you're not preaching. Amen. We should bring forth the gospel in such simple terms uh, that even the common can understand. Uh, in Mark chapter number 12, uh, the Bible talks about how the religious people rejected what Jesus had to say. They thought of him as a fool, uh, but the Bible says this, Brother Howard, the common people heard him gladly. You know who Jesus hung out with? A bunch of common sinners. A Syrophoenician woman, and uh, she says, Lord, I need some help. And uh, Jesus says, Listen, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She says, Lord, I know it, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall off the master's table. And when Jesus heard that, he had compassion on her, he loved on her. There's those disciples standing around thinking, uh-huh, he told us only to go to Israel. Jesus has done gone to the dogs. I'm here to tell you, thank God, Jesus came to the dogs. Hey, I felt some right there. You're looking at an old Gentile dog. And I'm glad Jesus doesn't just love Jews. He loves us dogs. Common people. Abraham Lincoln once said, God must love the common man. He sure made a lot of them. When it was time to get a band of preachers together, Jesus didn't say, Let me go down to the seminary at Jerusalem and find the smartest one. No. He walked out by the seashore found a bunch of old roughneck fishermen and said, hey, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Common people in the hands of a powerful God can do uncommon things. Ordinary people in the hands of a powerful God can do extra ordinary things. Paul did 
didn't want any personal recognition. He didn't come to proclaim his own self. He felt the same way John the Baptist did. I must decrease and Christ must increase. He came to lift up Jesus. He came to preach Christ crucified, buried, and risen again. And that salvation was not available through religion, but it was available through Christ alone. not against humanitarian efforts. If an organization wants to feed the hungry, I'm for it. If an organization wants to clothe the poor, I'm for it. But listen, if all we do is minister to the body and we neglect the soul, then we've not fulfilled what Christ, amen, we've not fulfilled what Christ has sent us to do. How about a meal with a message? How about some food with an offer of a robe of righteousness that'll cover them and keep them whole and warm? Let's not just work on the outer man. Let's go fishing for the souls of mankind. And keep the ministry majoring on the gospel, not the wisdom of men. Every week in my mailbox, and I mean this, there's not a week that goes by that I don't get some advertisement. If you'll take this pill, you'll lose 30 pounds in 30 days. If you'll take this supplement, you'll never again struggle with blood pressure or cholesterol or whatever it is they're fighting against. Uh, take this and take that. And then we'll get one from a financial advisor. If you'll come and listen to our seminar and do what we say, you'll never have another financial trouble. Uh, I get self-help books, uh, emails inviting me to the latest conference, uh, magazines and all these things uh, to help myself. Uh, but I say to you, uh, though those things may be noble uh, and they may be good in some ways, uh, they will not satisfy uh, the greatest need uh, that man has uh, and the greatest need uh, that I have uh, and that you have uh, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not offering people things. I'm offering people Jesus. The gospel has the power to reach the lost sheep. Now notice Paul's confident ministry. He said, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in trembling. This is talking about the flesh. Paul clothed himself in humility. He could have boasted about his intelligence and his wisdom, but he kept himself clothed in the garment of humility. Listen, Pastor, listen, Brother Steve, anybody else in here who ministers, we have got to keep ourselves clothed in humility. If we step behind God's pulpit with an attitude, God won't honor that. If we step behind God's sacred desk with pride and arrogance, God won't honor that. We must be clothed in humility when we stand for Christ. Here's what I'm recognizing. My ability has never saved anybody. My ability has never built a church. My, and I'm thankful for that. I'm glad uh, that the success uh, and the future uh, and the hope uh, of our ministries uh, is not based on our flesh uh, or the ability of our minds. Uh, it's based uh, on the ability uh, of the Spirit of God. Uh, and if we'll preach Christ uh, and Him crucified, the Holy Ghost uh, will honor that uh, and He will work uh, to draw people to Jesus. Now listen, churches don't prosper because of the abilities of men. They prosper because of the ability of the Holy Ghost. God will share His peace with you. 
God will share his power with you. God will share his love with you. But God will never share his glory with you. What do you mean by that? I mean this. He won't let you get half the glory and him the other half. It's all his. If you do anything, if I do anything, if I get a compliment, if you get a compliment, it ought to be immediately to God be all the glory. For some reason, I don't think some of you hear me tonight. <coughs> For someone to say that's good preaching and me to say, well, thank you is the wrong spirit. For someone to say, man, you all sang and played good tonight, you thank you, the wrong spirit. It ought to be if there was anything good from you, if there was anything good uh, out of this mouth, uh, then to God uh, be all the glory, uh, to Jesus uh, be all the praise. Uh, it is not about us. It's about Jesus. If a minister builds large congregations, baptizes all kinds of people, gets asked to speak at all the prayer breakfasts that his denomination holds, <laughs> has colleges that have his name on the side of buildings, and all these honorary things about this certain person, but he doesn't give the glory to Jesus Christ. You know what God says? That ministry is a failure. It's a flop. On the flip side, if you ever build oh. auditoriums that seat thousands, if nobody ever takes your picture and puts it on the front of their religious magazine, if you never get your name tattooed on the side of the building uh, at the Bible College, uh, if you never have the privilege uh, of baptizing 5,000 uh, in one service, uh, but every little thing you do is not about Tony, uh, it's all about Jesus, uh, then God looks down and he says, this minister is not a failure, he's a success in the eyes of God. And I would rather be a failure to the whole world and a success to my father than to be a success to men and a failure to my God. <coughs> Let me show you the last thing, and it's a clear motivation. Paul says in verse 5 that your faith will not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Why? Did Paul preach Christ and him crucified? Why do I preach Christ and him crucified? It's very simple. So that your faith is in him, not in the man. So you hear some people talk, and all you hear is the name of a man. Well, Dr. Ruckman says, and Dr. Sexton says, and Brother Hagee says, and I can make a list of 50,000 more, but if it's all about a man and you never hear anything about Jesus, then their faith is resting on the wrong foundation. Question, if your faith is in a man and that's your foundation, What's going to happen to you if that man ever crumbles? You're going down with it. But if your faith is resting in the power of God, if your faith is in the Lord Jesus, who's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, then you have a foundation that is never going to crumble when the winds blow. My friend, when the thunder crashes and the lightning flashes and your life is falling apart, you'll still be standing on the rock of ages. Yeah. 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 A few times I've hit rock bottom. 
but I'm still on the rock. Amen. Because my faith is not in the wisdom of men, but it's in the power of God. Amen, bro. I'm closing with this question. What is it you're depending on tonight? What have you placed your faith in? Let's go ahead and shoot this down. You told me to say whatever God told me to say. Is that right? If your faith is in religion, I feel sorry for you. <clears throat> if you think for a moment that you're going to get to heaven because of where you go to church, I feel sorry for you. If all you can say is, you know, back when I was six years old, I, I went forward and I don't remember a thing, uh, but so-and-so uh, said a few words over me and he told me uh, that I was saved, uh, but there's no conviction, uh, there's never been a change in my life, uh, I have no desire for God, then friend, it's time uh, that you junk all of that uh, and you get down here and you say, God, I want Jesus. Amen. Nothing else. Nothing. Amen. If this were my last night on earth, and I stood before God, and I don't know how it will be, and you don't either, but if God were to say to me, why should I let you in my kingdom? <laughs> I have a one word answer. <coughs> Jesus. Here's the news for you. Any other answer besides Jesus? And the next words you'll hear is depart from me. I never knew you. It's Jesus now. And it'll be Jesus then. You're not 100% sure that your faith is resting in the power of God. And I urge you to come down here in just a moment when we do the song. I urge you to come down here and say, God, I don't want religion. I don't want myself. I want Jesus. God will hear and answer that prayer. And if you're saved tonight, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You ought to come down here and say, Lord, I am giving you my life. When I leave here tonight, give me a fresh boldness by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I'll stop speaking about everything else and I'll go out of here talking about Jesus and Him alone. If you're physically able, stand with us all over the house. Yeah. As we prepare a song, whatever you guys have on your heart is fine with me. But I'm asking you to kindly bow your head for just a moment, please. I'm not coming to you. I will not embarrass you. All that I would like to be able to do is know how to intelligently pray for you. And so if you're here this evening and you're unsure as to whether or not you've ever embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ personally, then please let me pray for you. Is there one here and you'd say, Pastor Jeremiah, I am not 100% sure that I am saved. Would you pray for me? God bless you. Is there another? Anyone? Pastor Jeremiah, I am not 100% sure that I am saved. Would you pray for me? God bless you. I see that hand. Is there another? I appreciate these two that have been honest. If you're tired of religion, tired of self, tired of sin, and you really want Jesus, and in just a moment, when they begin to sing, I invite you to come, and I'll be glad to pray with you. Or if you're here this evening and you're saved, but you'd say, Pastor Jeremiah, I want a holy boldness 
from the Spirit of God that I can open my mouth and speak Jesus, speak life into someone. Pray that God would give me that boldness. If that's in your heart, would you lift your hand? God bless you. God bless you. I see these hands. You are invited to come as the Spirit leads you. Father, in Jesus' name, use what's been said for the glory of God and Him alone. Bless the invitation. If it be thy will, O oh Lord, may someone come to thee in your holy name. Jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. Not you come? a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. Would you come? And all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. 